Good evening and welcome to everyone for the Vespers service. We are delighted that he could be here and we praise God that he has led us safely through another week. Whatever challenges you have faced, we know that the Lord has given you strength and may we cast all our burdens, our cares at the feet of Jesus and find sweet rest today. Let's pray. Our holy and gracious God, loving Father, I thank you so much for this time to gather together virtually and to praise your holy name. I pray that you will be with each one of us, Lord, as we worship you. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray that we would cast all our cares upon Jesus and find sweet rest in him today on this day of rest and gladness. We pray in a special way for your servant and for the message that he's going to bring to us about Israel and the last war. Oh Lord, we know that we are living in the last days and I pray, Father, that you will please help us to understand this important message. May you use him once again for your glory and help us to be blessed by your word. We pray that you would come soon, Lord. We know these are all the signs of the end. We're waiting for your soon return and help us to prepare to that end. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Shepherd divine, I know thou art mine. Thy search in the night was for me. This bleak world is cold, but warm is thy fold. My shepherd, I follow thee. Thy beautiful lamp shineth bright o'er my way, thy glorious light unto thy perfect day. Through pastures serene, through valleys of green, my shepherd I follow thee. O shepherd divine, I know thou art mine, thy great heart was broken for me. Thy grace and thy law, I picture it all, they kissed upon Calvary. How life that was given to ransom my soul, a heart that was broken to make sinners whole. This world is but lost in view of thy cross. My shepherd, I follow thee. O shepherd divine, I know thou art mine. I hear thee say, follow thou me. Thy message today illumines my way, the spirit of prophecy. I thrill at thy marvelous love to thy sheep, the way thou dost lead to the still waters deep, what staff and what rod, what fold and what God, my shepherd I follow thee. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Nice to see you all. Let's ask God to bless our study of the Bible. Lord, our lives are yours. May they be yours in the ordinary as well as in the holy. And may our lives be sanctified by your presence. Now we're about to open the word. 
And I'm praying, Lord, that we would sense its relevance and its prophetic teachings. So guide us now, I ask, and bless us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Entitled this message, Israel, the Antichrist, and the Messiah. It's very important for us to understand what's going on in the world. Two weeks ago, I preached on Israel and Bible prophecy. I hope if you didn't get to see that, that you will go back and study it and recognize that God has always had one people. He is always looking to bring as many as he can into the fellowship of that one people. And while Israel fulfilled a firstborn role in the New Testament to tell the world they could belong to God's family, uh, that role was forfeited when they rejected Jesus as the one who came to confirm the covenant. Now, much of the world sits right now placed on the precipice of major, regional, and potential global war because of a misunderstanding of Bible prophecy. There is in the Bible the longest prophecy that is given in Scripture, at least timeline prophecy. And that prophecy tells us that from the days of the post-exilic Israel, so after the exile... Daniel was shown a period of 2,300 evenings and mornings. In Bible prophecy, according to Ezekiel 4.6, a day equals a year. So this becomes a prophecy that stretches out over two millennia of time. The first part of that prophecy is what is called the 70 weeks prophecy. These prophecies have captured the interests of people through the years and right now especially. That 70 weeks prophecy is clearly a prophecy in regard to the nation of Israel. At the heart of where the largest misunderstanding prophetically may be at our current moment is what happens during the 70th week, the last seven years of that 470-year, 490-year prophecy. The modern evangelical world believes that the last year is about the Antichrist and the reinstitution of Israel on the face of the planet. They believe the temple will be rebuilt. They believe the Antichrist will appear in the temple. They believe at the beginning of that last seven years, the church will be raptured, a secret rapture. They believe the Jewish nation will be converted. They believe they will then evangelize the world, and they believe that God's thousand-year kingdom will be here on planet Earth. If the 70th week of the 490-year prophecy is really about the Antichrist, then they are right and we are wrong. But if the 70th week is really about the coming of Jesus himself to try to put this family back together in hopes that Abraham and David and all the faithful in the lineage could see their family ambitions and hopes and promises grow, then we have a completely different situation on our hands. This Bible, the Schofield Bible, printed in 1909, was printed in a King James Version of the Bible, which was the authorized version, has been so called. And because the study notes to this Bible were put in with the King James Version of the Bible, many people believed that this teaching of dispensationalism, that last seven years, a special dispensation for the Jews, They believed that this was the prophetic biblical interpretation. Now, all of modern evangelicalism, or most, I should say, believes in these seven epochs or ages or dispensations. And to make it simple, at the very end of the sermon, I'll show them to you, but to make it simple for right now, I'll just focus on the last three. From Exodus chapter 20 all the way up to the book of Acts chapter 2 is the dispensation for the Jews. It's a dispensation of law. It is especially, specifically focused for the Jews, so they say. The dispensation from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost up until the secret rapture is the dispensation of grace. That's for the church. But the church is supposedly not going to go through any time of trouble because they will be raptured away. They will be taken away in this secret appearing of Jesus. And then the last dispensation, so you've got the dispensation for the Jews, it's the dispensation of the law. I hope your minds are really working and saying to yourself, well, if, if that dispensation was only for the Jews, then maybe the law is only for the Jews. 
I want you to be thinking. The dispensation so-called of grace is for the church. It goes up to the secret rapture and then the dispensation of the Antichrist or the final dispensation for the Jews where they get restored to them what they failed to embrace in the age of the law. Now this study Bible made this belief system prominent. And most of our Republican uh, Congress, if they have a prophetic belief, and many of them are conservative Christians, they believe in this dispensational form of prophecy, which means if the last dispensation must reestablish Israel, then what superpower on the face of the planet would like to be on the wrong side of Bible prophecy? So they're going to support Israel no matter what. So if you don't know who Israel is, and you think it's a geopolitical entity, not an entity defined by faith in a promise given to Abraham, and then defined by transformation in a transforming wrestling night of prayer with Jacob becomes Israel, if you don't understand that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but who is one inwardly, circumcised, changed on the inside, then you could be in a serious moment of miscalculating. And if you happen to be the largest, most powerful government in all the world, and you think that you're supposed to make sure that Israel gets its final showing and its final dispensation, you might enter into geopolitical decisions the wrong way. This is a big deal. And I want you to know our world is perched on the edge of regional, if not global, conflict. What I also want you to know before I go into this study is that not, not only does America have its mind prophetically confused on regards to what the whole dynamic of this amazing prophecy in the book of Daniel 8 and 9 is all about, but the Jewish people themselves have a desire to rebuild their temple, which is one of the things that is predicted will happen during this final dispensation. And so it's not just that America sees itself as holding up the hands of the Israelites. It's the concept that the devil might actually pull off parts of these things in order to deceive you. Now let's just imagine for a moment, there will not be a secret rapture, okay? Jesus will not allow this to happen. It's not his method. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But let's just imagine for a moment... Of the five things predicted in dispensationalism, let's imagine that even one of them came true. So I'm going to pick the one that I think has the greatest likelihood of coming true. Let's just imagine that maybe the temple actually does get rebuilt. Everybody wants it to happen that's in, in um, what I'm... I wouldn't say everybody, but many inside of Judaism and many inside of the religious evangelical world. Everybody wants to see it happen. Let's just say it did happen. Now, number one, the timeline for dispensationalism has been blown out of the water. In 1948, the nation was reestablished. According to dispensational thinking, by 1981, the secret rapture should have happened, and by 1988, it all should have been history. The thousand-year millennium should have begun. And in the middle of that seven-year period, from 1981 to 1988, the Antichrist should have come and sat on the throne in the temple and made an end of animal sacrifices. Yes? You heard me right. In 1981, when the seven years begins, the temple is to be rebuilt. Animal sacrifices are supposed to be reinstated. The Antichrist is supposed to get in there and stop them and sit on the throne. But let's just say, in the midst of all this prophetic gobbledygook and confusion, that the temple actually was rebuilt. And let's just say that maybe there was an offering offered on that temple sacrifice. And maybe, since the Bible says the devil's going to make fire come down of heaven, maybe the fire would come down and consume that. What would that do? Would that not look like the reincarnation of the Sol Solomonic temple? Would that not look like the power on Mount Carmel? What I'm really trying to say to you is that as Seventh-day Adventists, we used to be known as people of the book. You, can afford, you cannot afford to miss being at, at prophecy seminars, at evangelistic meetings. At the, you cannot afford to miss these things because we're going to be put into the highest pressure cooker of prophetic and well, deception there's ever been. We will be deceived by our eyes if our minds don't know better from the Word of God. And so what I'm going to share with you this morning is exceptionally important 
so that when the deceptions come in the visible, tangible, audible dynamics, and they will come. That's why Jesus said, if somebody says he's in the desert, don't go. Because it's going to be so masterly and so overpowering that you're going to look at it and say, it's the real deal. But it won't be. It'll be the last lie and the greatest deception. So this Schofield Bible and this teaching of these seven epics, with an epic for the Jews and an epic for the church and a final chance for the Jews, this is at the heart of the greatest prophetic deception that has probably ever been foisted on planet Earth. It was promulgated, and it is promulgated, by the Dallas Theological Seminary. And Hal Lindsey's book sold in the millions. And as one person would say, seldom has a prophet been accorded such honor, or rather sales, in his own land. That's kind of sarcastic. That's what this person is saying. And I want to tell you, today people are making lots of money on these things. Now, I'm here to tell you, if you go online and Google Israel and prophecy, you're going to find sermons by people who believe this that are being viewed in the millions. And last week, as I was near Washington, D.C. for some meetings with our church, I was watching a major news channel, and on the channel was an advertisement for Dr. David Jeremiah's new book called The Great Disappearance. And it actually dramatized in a way I'd never seen dramatized before, especially on a commercial, and especially on a major news outlet, the actual uh, supposed secret rapture. So you've got students disappearing off buses, and you've got the UPS man disappearing after he drops off your package. The people of the world right now are open to listening and looking and learning like they've never been before. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the storyline of the prophecies points to Jesus, the Christ, not to the Antichrist. And at the center of dispensational thinking is the final seven-year period that is about the rebuilding of the temple and the Antichrist and a second chance for the Jews. I'm here to tell you, friends, when Jesus came to confirm the covenant, that was the best chance they had to renew their hearts and be made into the people God wanted them to be. And there's no Antichrist in the future that's going to be able to do what the genuine Christ did. Let's go ahead and go a little farther in our study. I pointed this out to you in previous years, Hal Lindsey's Prophetic Jigsaw Puzzle, amazing book, short book, easy read book by Dr. Samuel Bakioki, who is now deceased, but he pulls apart the prophecies, and those prophecies are such that even the non-Adventists tell us that Dr. Bakioki has done it all a favor by holding such prophets as Hal Lindsey to scholarly account. The unfortunate thing is Hal Lindsey gets an F- minus in predicting the future. Now, this is important to know about dispensationalism. Although dispensationalism is best known for its eschatological doctrines, mainly the secret rapture, that's what starts the final seven years. Every other distinctively dispensationalist doctrine rests on this idea, and the idea is that there is a distinction between Israel and the church. Now, I'm going to show you in the scriptures before we're done, there is no difference between Israel and the church. The difference between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Israel is simply that the New Testament Israel allowed the prince of the covenant, the Messiah, to do in their hearts what some in geopolitical Israel refused to do. Geopolitical Israel, even in the name of the church, crucified Jesus. But at the heart of this doctrine and its confusion is the idea that Israel and the church are two different groups. And I'm here to tell you, the scriptures will make this very clear, that is not the case. What this distinction means for dispensationalists is that there are two peoples of God. I hope there's scriptures running through your mind right now, bells going off saying, no, for there's neither Jew nor Greek. I mean, I hope some of these things are running through your mind. Israel is one of these two groups and consists of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The church is the other, and it consists of all those and only those, whether Jew or Gentile, who were saved between the day of Pentecost and the rapture. Now, Jews can be saved in their mind in this uh, period of grace, but there are two groups of people. You're going to see how deadly this is. Part of the reason for the pre-tribulation rapture, so before the time of trouble, the secret rapture comes and saves the church from going through the trouble, is to remove the church of God from the earth so that God can begin dealing with the nation of Israel. And I want this word, it's a big word, again. Now listen, this is a very destructive doctrine. 
Jesus came the first time, and on Wednesday of the week before he died, he walked out of the sanctuary and he said, your house, not my father's house. Before he had said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. But when he walked out on that Wednesday afternoon, he said, your house is left unto you desolate. If God himself comes and he's the owner of the vineyard and they decide after beating and stoning all the previous prophet, prophetic messengers that this is the heir, let, him kill, let us kill him and, and we'll be in charge of everything. If the father actually sends his son, is there any more the son can do to redeem those individuals? Yes or no? No. But I want you to see wrapped up in this are two deadly supposed deceptions. Number one is... The Jewish nation gets a second chance as a geopolitical entity. It's not going to happen. Jesus came to confirm that there's nothing more God can do to redeem it. If Christ couldn't do it, the Antichrist can't do it. And number two, what I want you to see in this as well, is there's a deadly, a, a deadly offering of a second chance for the church as well. Because the church, as long as there's a secret rapture, has two second comings. They have the one that comes, it's a secret, where, where those that are ready go. And they have the one that comes at the end of the seven years that are gotten ready through the time of tribulation and through the Jewish nation that supposedly becomes converted and proselytizes the world. There is no second chance for the church either. God came to, con God came to confirm the covenant with Israel, his Old Testament church, the ecclesia. I'm going to show you at Acts 7.38. That when Stephen is preaching his last sermon, before he dies, at the very end of the the 70 weeks, at the very end of the 490 years, he refers in Acts 7.38 to the church in the wilderness, the ecclesia. And what I want you to see is that when Paul picks up his imagery of a tree whose branches have been broken off, the Jewish nation, and other branches, the Gentiles, have been grafted in, Paul is going to make it clear that from the beginning of time, God has had faithful people. He gave the promise to Abraham. He hoped to do something special on the face of the earth through the nation of Israel, but it would have to be spiritual. It refused a spiritual relationship. It rejected the author of their salvation. They don't get a second chance. They have the same chance all of us do because there is salvation for Jew and Gentile still today. Amen? There is a special work for the Seventh-day Adventist church for the Jewish nation, by the way. And I praise the Lord that even some of our members are involved in this. But all of us should have a sense of understanding that we have captured the essence of the plan of salvation from the very first promise that the baby would grow into a man and step on the head of the snake all the way down to the last vindication of God's people to the very last announcement that there is still mercy before the hour of judgment is completely concluded. Five predictions that failed in regards to dispensationalism. Number one, the rapture would happen by 1981, a visible return by 1988. You can see there's seven years between that. Number two, the rise of the Roman Antichrist out of the ten nations of Europe and the common market. There is obviously, there, the, the false and the true are not completely black and white opposites. Obviously, there is something to a Roman Antichrist. We know that. The book of Romans of Revelation teaches it. Number three is the rebuilding of the tribulation temple. Has not happened. It may happen. But even if it does happen, it is not a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Number four, invasion of Israel by Arab African confederacy. That did not happen. And North Africa would become solidly pro-Soviet with Russia's help. All five of these things have failed. One of them may still be attempted. These are the failures of a belief system that believed from 1948 to 1988 was one biblical generation, and in that biblical generation, we would see these things happen. Well, folks, that time has come and gone by 20, 30 plus years. But there are still people who believe this. Now, I want to cue in on this prophecy. It is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, this is the most amazing time prophecy in all of Scripture. It will announce when Jesus is baptized. It will tell us about Jesus' death. It will announce the close of probation for the Jews as the covenant people. And it will proclaim an hour of judgment just before the final acts of God's cleansing the earth after cleansing the sanctuary. Now, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, this is an amazing time period spanning 
to millennia. A day is equal to a year in Bible prophecy. Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So what does this cleansing mean? This is really the question. And I'm going to give you just a little primer on what it means. God directed Moses that they should make a sanctuary that they could, he could dwell amongst them. Now, this sanctuary was a living representation of what would become salvation prophecy. It is a prophecy. And there are three phases to it. There is the outer court. There is the, most holy, the holy place and the, most, and the most holy place. So here's the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. God lived amongst his people. This was a teaching of how the plan of salvation worked. In the outer court, we had the, sa- the sacrifice of the lamb. In the holy place, we had the mediation of the high priest. And in the most holy, mediation of the priest. And in the most holy place, the mediation of the high priest. The lamb was slain. This took place in the outer court. The sinner's guilt was symbolically transferred to the perfect lamb. John the Baptist would announce that Jesus is the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. The entire Old Testament sanctuary teaching was a sandbox story of the coming salvation that Jesus himself would inaugurate and provide for us. We can see here again a rendition of it. Um, Jesus offers the merits of his blood in heaven on our behalf. He becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That Lamb is what stands between the sinner and the holy presence of God. Now, the Day of Atonement or Day of Judgment is the cleansing of the sanctuary. It happens one time of year. The high priest goes in there. There are two goats that are chosen, and the blood of these goats is brought in behind the final veil, which you can see on the left here. And there is atonement made for all of the nation. Every Israelite was to examine their heart. And these are the way they repeated themselves. The two compartments of the outer courtyard and the holy place were daily. And the ministry of the most holy place was yearly. He said unto me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The Day of Atonement is the cleansing of the sanctuary. It was an illustration of God's judgment in the heavenly sanctuary that will occur just before Jesus comes. That 2,300-day prophecy came to an end in 1844. But these were things Daniel didn't understand. So, make the man understand the vision. If you want to understand the book of Daniel, it explains itself in most places. And so the goat and the ram that's explained in the first part of the chapter, he explains. But there's a time part because Daniel repeats itself over the chapters. And when you get to Daniel chapter 8, we get this new experience of this very long prophecy. So he came near where I stood and he came and I was afraid and I fell on my face. And he said to me, understand, son of man, that the the vision refers to the time of the end. I've appointed thee each day for a year is a prophetic and biblical definition of how time prophecy works, and we know that this 2,300 days equals 2,300 literal years. Now, if the Bible gives us the starting point for the 2,300 years, then we could easily calculate the ending point, which we will do. The Bible will tell us 70 weeks are determined for your people. In answer to prayer, the angel explains this time prophecy. So 70 weeks, 70 times 7 will be 400 and 90. This is Daniel's people. There's a special effort by God to bring to a successful conclusion the promises that he made to Abraham. Seventy weeks are determined. The Hebrew word is cut off. Cut off from what? The larger time period that's been discussed for your people and for your holy city. So these 70 prophetic weeks will add up to 490 prophetic days, a day equaling a year. So almost 500 years for God to try to make something of this relationship he's had with Israel. Now, it's strange, perhaps not strange, perhaps beautifully uh, providential, that when Peter asked Jesus if he should forgive his brother seven times, Jesus says, no, try seven times 70. In other words, for 500 years, or almost 500 times, if you're Peter, you have to have this divine patience Now, Daniel's in exile. He's been studying the book of Jeremiah. He knows it's about to end. That is the 70 years of exile that were predicted by Daniel, by Jeremiah. And 
He's curious now about what the future holds. 70 weeks, 490 years. The prophecy starts with a clear biblical injunction. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, all right? So Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. At this moment in time, while Daniel's praying, it's in ruins. It's in ruins because Jeremiah prophesied and told Israel, Nebuchadnezzar will come. Nebuchadnezzar came three times. The first time he took Daniel and the royal potential uh, seed for a training to come back as puppet governors. But Israel rebelled, and so Nebuchadnezzar came back a second time. That time, he took 10,000 tradesmen, and he took the prophet Ezekiel back to Babylon. And everybody left in Jerusalem said, yes, we will obey you, Nebuchadnezzar, but he barely got out of town before the rebellion began again. And then finally, in 606, 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar comes back and he destroys everything. But you need to know, God, even in that moment, gave Israel amazing opportunities to not see their city destroyed and their family members and friends massacred in the streets. But the prophecy tells us that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, and it was. It was rebuilt during a period of time that took approximately 49 years. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now... You have to remember that in Jesus' day, they talked about this temple taking 49 years to build. That was prophesied. There was a period of rebuilding of the temple. Then there were 62 weeks. So you have seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks. There's more, most of the 70 weeks prophecy. 69 weeks. Now we're coming up to the place where either we're going to see Jesus or we're going to see the Antichrist because we're coming into the last seven years. So here's the question. Is the prophetic way of interpreting prophecy from the Reformation onward and from the Bible is the prophetic way that God will announce a start so you can know the finish? Or is the prophetic way you'll know it when you see it? Now that's what dispensationalism teaches. They teach that this 70th week, which we're about to look at, you'll know it when you see it. You'll know it when the secret rapture happens. Of course, there is going to be no secret rapture, bad English, sorry, but it's a fact. There won't be a secret rapture. And so what's going to happen is the world's going to be looking for something to wake them up when in reality, God's got the most amazing Bible prophecy to say, hey, look, I know things before they come to be. So we come to this 490 years. We can see it's specifically designed to renew the covenant with the Jewish nation who had turned their back on God's prophets. And the rest of it was going to be the fulfillment of an amazing 2,300 years in which God was going to go into a work specifically for the Gentiles. 69 prophetic weeks until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seems pretty simple to me that leading up to the Messiah the Prince, the anointed one, would be 483 years. Jesus came and would be baptized exactly on time in A.D. 27. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And the Bible tells us when, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. That can be historically as well as prophetically established as A.D. 27. So now, at A.D. 27, we have a biblical prophecy telling us when the last week of the 490 is going to begin. A.D. 27, the beginning of the Messiah, the prince's ministry. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So now let's watch it. One prophetic week, seven days or seven years. He confirms the covenant with many, according to Daniel 9, 25. And in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now let's just contrast the two views for a minute. In the prophetic view of Daniel, this is about the Messiah, the anointed one, who will be baptized with the Holy Spirit as well as baptized in the water, and he will begin a process of trying to show the nation of Israel what it really means to be so gloriously privileged with the story of salvation. They will reject his offer of salvation because they will reject the call to repentance. By the way, friends, Seventh-day Adventism is not immune. We can reject the call to repentance as well. As a matter of fact, the shaking will come because of the straight testimony which will call us unto an experience of repentance. Is your heart hard? Can anybody talk to you about what you're doing wrong? 
If the answer is yes for heart being hard and no for nobody being able to break through, you might find yourself on the same raw end of the deal that much of the Jewish race was on when they rejected Jesus. In the middle of the week, he's going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So, according to the biblical view, type will meet anti-type. Symbol will meet reality. Jesus will be the Lamb of God that pays the price of the entire world, and there will no longer be a need for another blood animal sacrifice. Can anybody say amen? The truth of the matter is this is the most amazing Bible prophecy there is because it points us to the cross, which is the hinge, it's the fulcrum on which all of our hope and salvation history swings. Now, in the other point of view, which the seven final years of this prophecy can be yanked out of a time of beginning and a time of end, that seventh year can be pulled out, put somewhere out, floating in the prophetic future. When the, when the secret rapture happens, then we know the seventh year starts, and what will happen is the Jews will start up live animal sacrifices again, they say, and the Antichrist will come and end that, and that's what brings an end to sacrifice and offering. Every thinking Christian is going to have to come up with an understanding, they believe, from the Scriptures, that they actually believe glorifies the God of all prophecy who knows the end from the beginning and has focused his attention on the human race. Now, it's completely clear that the ultimate consummation of any covenant would be made by the one who originated the covenant and would shed his blood to renew the covenant. This is nothing less than a prediction that Christ would come and as the lamb, not the symbol or the type, but of the reality, he would make an end of all this needless sacrificing of animals. So in the middle of the week, we have the cross. Jesus dies in the 70th week. It's the end of his ministry on earth. We know he ministered for three and a half years. Fortunately, the opportunity for the Jews is not over because you still have three and a half years of the apostles doing the work that they weren't prepared to do until they came to the cross. Now, I want to show you the seven dispensations that dispensationalism believes. One is the innocence. They, they relegate that to the garden. Two is conscience. That's from Genesis 3 to 8. Human government, which doesn't work out too good. Tower of Babel, etc. Then there's the promise from the time of Abraham in Genesis 12 up until the Exodus. Then there's the law. Now, I did this on purpose because this is the dispensation for the Jews. And if the dispensation for the Jews is really two separate people groups and there is a dispensation of law, that means the law is only for that dispensation. And of course, that's what lots of Christians teach. Then you come to the dispensation of grace, and then you come to the millennial kingdom, which is the last seven years. Those are the seven years we just looked at that are pulled out of the 1844, from 457 B.C. to 1844, the 2300 days. Now, I'm not going to take the time this morning to go back to Daniel 8 and 9, except to tell you that on October 22, 1844, when there was this great disappointment, something fantastic began to happen in heaven, and that is God was getting ready for the final restoration of the kingdom with his people. Now, there are seven doctrines that dispensationalism wars distinctly against and destroys. The doctrine of the church, the law, the Sabbath, the second coming, the sanctuary, salvation, and the cross. Now, it's not just that they're messed up prophetically. It's not just that it's colossal confusion about the most amazing Christ-centered prophecy in the Bible, at least time prophecy. It's that it wipes out all kinds of other clear Bible teachings. So let's just do the doctrine of the church, all right? Is there really two churches in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament church? Or is it one constant fellowship with God with an hope that Israel could be the elder brother and fulfill the invitation to all the earth to come unto me, all ye that are labor, labor and heavy laden, and you'll find rest. In Acts chapter 7, verse 38, Stephen is preaching his last sermon. He's going to die. This is the end of the 490 years. It's three and a half years after the death of Jesus. And this will be the final invitation to the official Jewish church to accept the fact that Jesus was Lord. And this is what he says. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to pause right now. Jesus led them in the wilderness. Paul is clear on that. He was the spiritual rock. He was the spiritual food. He was the shade by day and the warmth by night. 
But I want you to look at that word church. It's the word ecclesia. It was the church in the wilderness with which the angel spake to him in Mount Sinai and our fathers who received the lively oracles given to us. This is a Jewish man talking to a Jewish Sanhedrin. It was the church in the wilderness. Let's look at it from the New Living Translation. Moses was with our ancestors, the assembly of God's people. That word is translated church in the King James Version. But it's the ecclesia in the wilderness when the angel spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And there Moses received life-giving words to pass on to us. Hardly sounds like the law is bad. But what I want you to see here is in the mind of Stephen, the church has a continuation. It was in the wilderness and it's now on the other side of the cross. But it's not Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New. No, it was the church in the wilderness. Here we go. This is the one who was in the congregation. I think this is the New American Standard in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. It's the church that was there at the Mount of Sinai. Now, let's, let's get just a little bit more clear. If we think there's actually two groups of people, the Jews and the church, let's see if Paul agrees. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have closed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And by the way, just to remind you, all the doors have the sons of Jacob on them. All the foundation stones have the apostles, and all the 144,000 are named according to the tribes. There's a reason for that, because if you're born into Christ, you're born into the promise of Abraham, and you are a descendant of Abraham. All right, let's go a little bit farther. And if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Here's another one. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. Now we're talking about the Old Testament. Gentiles weren't allowed in, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into what? One. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now for Paul, there can be no doubt, just as for Stephen, that God has always had a voice, he's always had a representative, even though the firstborn, which was Israel, has rejected their place in the stewardship of the messaging, the stewardship of the prophetic work and the missionary work, God is not without a witness now, and the experience now will embrace the same spiritual transformation that turned Jacob into Israel. But we're in a new moment after the commitment. Now, the commitment and the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, let's look at the law. If the law is really the experience of the Jews, there's a real problem here. And of course, most people in modern evangelicalism say that the Old Testament is about law, the New Testament is about grace, those laws are not for us. The problem is, is that there's 10 laws that the world needs desperately right now. You want to see what lawlessness looks like? Just go to a big city in America, places you don't want to go. Lawlessness is bad. I want to tell you, our hearts are at enmity with God until we meet Jesus. Then we start a journey of turning away from that which we turn naturally to. But I want to tell you, the law is a form of protection to our relationships. And when our hearts are right, the law is actually gospel because I actually do want to be able to leave my computer sitting on a table and walk away in this church and come back and find it an hour or two later. All of those things are written to protect us. One who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having to become forgetful here, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Don't have time to show it to you, but if you go to James chapter 1, you'll see where he talks about not coveting, not lying, and not stealing. He's clearly talking about the Exodus 20 law. But when you look at dispensational teaching, Exodus 20 is where the dispensation for the Jews begins. That law is not for you and me, they say. But let's read in the book of Hebrews. This is especially important. This is the covenant. Now remember, this is, I believe it's Paul. Some aren't convinced of that. But he's writing, whoever it is, to the Jewish believers. And notice what he says. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Covenant is a powerful word, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Does this sound like the author believes that the law is problematic? 
This is for the church. When a person has a renewed heart, they have no problem with the law, except sometimes the battle that goes on inside them to obey it. Now let's go to the Sabbath. The problem also with two churches, the Old Testament as are the two people groups, the, the Jews and the New Testament church, is that if you get rid of the law, you've certainly gotten rid of the Sabbath. But it is interesting that Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man. He could have said for Israel. He could have said for the descendants of Abraham. But he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a divine gift. And in this harried world we live in, more people are discovering its beauty. The Sabbath is not legalism. The Sabbath is liberty from the tyranny of the urgent and even the important. The second coming. This is another place where if you have a wrong understanding of how God works with people groups. It's not Israel, two specific groups, Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New. The problem here is, is that dispensationalism destroys the New Testament teaching of the doctrine of Jesus' second coming. This is what the angel said after Jesus ascended into heaven. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. A real Christ ascended. A real Christ will descend to come back and get us. It's going to be a visible event. He's coming with clouds. And how many eyes will see him? Every eye is going to see him. He came veiled in poverty and human flesh the first time. He's coming back a glorified Christ the second. Christ's coming will be an audible event. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God. And what will be the result? Now listen, I was talking with someone who had a PhD in music performance the other day in the trumpet section. Very nice individual. Uh, not an Adventist, but a believer, I suspect. And you know what? He said the trumpets have to be careful because they're kind of proud. They make more noise than anybody else. And what's the result? It wakes the dead. The dead in Christ shall rise. And by the way, when you listen to our organ this evening, I think you'll be pretty impressed with the new uh, acoustics, the new dynamics. Now, I wish this would play. Is there any way in the sound booth you could make this play or the next slide play? This is a picture of the pergola. You're looking at our church on a very dark summer night. I don't know if it'll work or not. Let's see if the next one will. Okay, it's, it looks blurred because this is the first frame in a video. Now, I wish the video would play, but some of our software doesn't mesh well together. So I'm going to show you a slide out of the video. If this video were to play, you would watch our church on a dark summer night go from being unseen to seen. And I'm just going to grab one frame out of the video. Here it is. That's seconds later, same person standing in the same place, Looking at the church. That's what lightning does. Okay? Jesus doesn't want anybody in the dark about what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is that all the world's going to get a warning. Revelation 18 talks about it. Three angels tell us what our obligations, privilege, and responsibility are. Loud voices, megaphone. All right? It also destroys the doctrine of the sanctuary. Instead of knowing that there's a heavenly sanctuary where Christ died he died on the earth here. That's in the outer courtyard. We couldn't have death in heaven. Then he goes to a living ministry in the holy place. And then in 1844, he moves into a final ministry of vindicating judgment. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. Why do I have this up? Because this is the same speech from Stephen. And he's saying, look, what was on the earth was a pattern. It wasn't the real. It was a symbol. It was a type. It was a form. It was to teach. But we know from the book of Hebrews that there was a reality. There is a reality in heaven. And I'm, I'm not going to stay there very long, but Paul will tell us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus has gone to minister in a sanctuary made without hands. But how about salvation? The real problem with believing there's a big dispensation of law for one group of people and a big dispensation of grace for another people is that it destroys the simplest statements about salvation. Now, was Abraham saved by works or grace? By grace. Just as Abraham believed God, in other words, righteousness by faith, it was credited to him as righteousness. Therefore, recognize that it is those who are, who are of faith who are our sons of Abraham. Salvation is not by works in the Old Testament. You don't need to reconstitute Judaism to give it a second chance. The ultimate author of our salvation, Jesus, came to explain love 
and the gift of salvation. Abraham was a son of faith. In Galatians 3.11, it says now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. It does no one mean no one, we ought to ask ourselves. For the righteous one will live by faith. And let's do a little farther in the book of Galatians, which, by the way, is about righteousness by faith. Why does he use Abraham over and over again, who happens to be an Old Testament Hebrew? The scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And Paul makes it clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no two different plans of salvation. One for Old Testament Israel and one for the church. No, it's always been by faith. It's always been a gift. And God desires and delights to give it. One more. For all you were baptized into Christ and who clothed yourself with Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. That's why there's a Jewish name on every gate to the new Jerusalem. That's why there's a Jewish name on every foundation stone because we are reckoned as children of God through the promise made to Abraham. And then lastly, it's the doctrine of the cross. That's what's really destroyed by dispensationalism. It's the idea that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough to reach the Jews. I'm here to tell you, friends, Jesus himself said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw how many men? All men to myself. He came to his own, unfortunately, the Bible says, and his own received him not. There was a great divorce. There was a removal of the special privilege of that nation as being the expositors of God, the ones who would have the beautiful feet upon the mountains telling the good news. Yes, I'm here to tell you today, friends, that the 2300-day prophecy of which 490 years are carved out for Israel is not about the Antichrist. It's about the Christ who still is living to draw all men unto himself, Jew, Gentile, Palestinian, whoever you might be, the invitation stands. And the concept that Jesus will come secretly, that there's two groups of people that have to be saved. No, there's one. It's called sinful humanity. But I'm here to tell you today, if there's ever a moment to lift up the cross... It's the cross that made us all one. It's the cross that reconciled us. It's the cross who gave us the law, which points us to the Redeemer, who is also the lawgiver. It's the Christ who gave us the Sabbath, the rest. It's the Christ who will come back after announcing to the world without any kind of confusion that it's almost done. The world's about wrapped up. And by the way, it's looking worse now than maybe it's ever looked before. It's the same God who said salvation comes by grace through faith, not of works, it's the same God who said, I am enough for you and for the entire world, and it is a gift, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Indeed, friends, we are called as Seventh-day Adventists to show the proper display of prophetic history that described the rebuilding of the Old Testament temple after Daniel's day. It described the coming of Jesus, baptized on time, crucified, thus destroying the need for animal sacrifice. And finally, at the final sermon of Stephen, proclaiming the end of a special relationship with the nation of Israel. Paul describing that there's still hope for Israel grafted back into the tree, coming from the original rootstock. And it is our job today to announce that God's law still stands. The coming won't be a secret. All are invited and all of us have the responsibility of giving the invitation. Yes, we are to lift high the message of righteousness by faith, salvation as a gift, and the returning of the one who will restore what we lost in the garden. May we know that God has made provision through the cross to save Jew and Gentile, and there's no need for a special seven years in the Antichrist to do what the Christ hasn't already done. May God bless us as we lift high the cross. Death. 
there's no pain in that land above. Flowers there will never fade in that land I love. Take And all.